Chapter 19, Impact of Cognitive or Sensory Impairment on the Child and Family. We're going to start talking about cognitive impairment, which also uh, can be called mental retardation. It's usually more difficult to parents to hear that term mental retardation, but really these are synonymous terms. So what does it mean? It means that on an IQ test, you fall below 70 or 75. IQ is set where the mean is 100, so half of the population is above 100 and half are below, but just about everybody, normal, is considered from 85 to 115, so 15 points above or below um, 100. So these people are considerably below that. Uh, also we use um, deficits in diagnosing this. There needs to be two deficits out of these 10 uh, adaptive skill areas. Communication, self-care, home living, social skills, leisure, health and safety, self-direction, functional academics, community use, and work. Now, um, most of these kids will also have delays in gross and fine motor skills and also in their speech development. Most people who are mentally retarded follow in, fall into the mildly retarded group. That's 85% of individuals. And then our next lower group would be called trainable mentally retarded. And um, the first ones are mildly mentally retarded. These, this group is moderately mentally retarded. And this would be about 10% of our uh, intellectually cognitively delayed. Now, children, um, what are we going to see? We're going to probably see them miss their developmental milestones because they usually have uh, motor skill delays as well. We want to regularly do developmental assessments. This is particularly, you know, well child visits in a, a pediatrician's office so that we do catch those missed milestones early. And we want to get them into early intervention programs whether that's working with the family or getting them into preschools that are designed for these kids. The earlier we can do interventions, the better our outcomes uh, tend to be. We really want to teach these, child, these children self-help skills. They, and in infants, that means teaching them um, good eating, how to suck and swallow, and speech therapists can do amazing things with kids who have very uh, poor suck swallow reflexes. Uh, little older kids, it's going to be toileting and dressing and you know we're talking about early intervention here. Some of the very basic and early skills. We want to promote their optimal development. We want these kids to achieve as highly as they possibly can. Um, play and exercise, this is important. We want to expose these kids to sounds and sights and sensations. That's how children learn. These kids learn slower and take uh, require more intervention to learn. So we want to make sure we're not just leaving them lay there, that we're giving them lots of good interaction. Um, and there are things for these children nowadays. We talked about break the barriers uh, before Special Olympics. Um, those sort of programs wouldn't encourage families to get involved in. Here's a couple of pictures. And um, communication. So we said one of the areas that they can have problems uh, is communication or usually have problems. So verbal skills are usually the most delayed more than their other physical skills. And that can be so hard when your parents or your child can run away from you, but they can't communicate with you when you're telling them, stop, be still. And it makes discipline really pretty tough. But discipline needs to begin early. These kids do need to know there are limits and what those limits are. And they need to be taught specific behaviors, not why it's wrong they can't grasp that. Just, you do this, you don't do that. So I mean, leaving it just at, at what the desired behavior is or the, the behavior that is to be avoided. And they're not cognitively able to understand the reasons behind that. 
and so uh, behavior modification programs where this is what we want families to um, use rewarding positive behaviors and then having negative consequences for behaviors that we want to change and those negative consequences need to be appropriate to the child's age and abilities. Now socialization. Parents can help in teaching a, um, acceptable socialization. Um, we'll sometimes call these social stories. So we teach a child, they don't know this naturally. So we have to say when you meet someone you say hello, how are you? and then we have them practice that and then we have them practice when someone says hello how are you you respond with I'm fine how are you that has to be taught that doesn't necessarily come naturally um, as these kids grow older sexuality is a problem they tend to be very easily uh, manipulated and taken advantage of and they don't necessarily have um, the same um, ability to make good decisions, to look at consequences, uh, so they can be very sexually promiscuous and we need to think about that, make sure that that's been addressed with the family. So how do we care for these children during hospitalization? Well, we don't want to ignore them or isolate them. Um, we want to include the parents in the planning the child's care because they're the ones who know what the child can do and what the child can't do and what's going to you know, trigger a tantrum and what won't. So we do want to encourage the, the parents to be there but don't make them feel guilty if they're not or feel like they're totally responsible for everything. These kids are harder to raise than a normal healthy kid and these parents they may need a break. They may need to spend the first night home just sleeping and relaxing because this is hard to raise a kid with special needs. So we don't want them to feel guilty or that we won't help, but we certainly want to involve them and encourage them um, to be there as much as they can. These kids uh, can be really lonely, especially if the family isn't there, the, what they're used to is not there, so make sure that they do have toys, but toys that are appropriate for them. Uh, just because they're 10 doesn't mean they can handle toys that have small parts that can be aspirated. So we have to really think about what's safe for their developmental ability. And when we teach these kids why they're in the hospital or what's going on, we want to use very short, simple explanations. They really can't abstract or understand, um, you know, complex things. So simple short explanations and this is where you know having the dolls that have the same thing this is what it's going to look like is really great. Moving on to Down syndrome. Down syndrome almost always is trisomy 21 so it's an extra tr chromosome number 21. Uh, we do see the risk of Down syndrome start to go up in women over 30. It goes up just a little bit between 30 I said 30 35 goes up just a little bit between 35 and 40, it starts to go up significantly after 40. Um, so anymore, we really rarely are warning women over 35 of, that you know having children is risky. It's really not till you're over 40. However, because most children are born to women younger than that, the majority of Down syndrome infants are born to women who are under 35 years of age. Uh, just older women don't have that many children compared to younger women. Now there are a few exceptions to the trisomy 21 and that's this translocation. There can be switched chromosomes and I believe it's usually 15 and 22 that can be switched with the 21 or mosaicism which is where some cells have normal chromosomes and some have abnormal. And um, how what the percentages of normal to abnormal makes a big difference of how uh, highly functioning uh, these kids might be. More normal cells with m normal chromosomes, they have higher functioning levels. But those are very much the, the minority. Most are just a simple trisomy 21. So how is it diagnosed? Well, the definitive diagnosis is to look at the chromosomes. There are some uh, typical 
uh, facial features or features that we see. They have the abnormal eyes. They're kind of slanted upward and outward. The nose is very small and flat, the depressed nose bridge. The ears are very small and usually low set. Uh, the mouth is small, but the tongue is large and protrudes, and they keep the mouth open. Their hands are broad, but short, with short, stubby fingers, and they have a single crease across the palm. Where we have three creases, typically, they'll have just one crease that goes straight across. And then the real thing that these kids have, um, they tend to be short in stature, but they are incredibly flexible. Every joint seems to be... In, the, their range of motion is way beyond normal and their muscle tone is floppy, they're hypotonic. And here's a, a picture of that typical facies. You can see the eyes and the nose and the ears and then the large tongue and the small mouth. Okay, fragile X syndrome. Um, this is something that is very similar to autism in um, how the, the child behaves and when they're diagnosing autism, they usually, this is one of the things that they'll rule out before they diagnose somebody as autistic or having autism. It's an abnormal gene on the lower end of the long arm of the X chromosome. Now, unlike our other X chromosome related things, it's not a simple, um, the pattern of inheritance is, is not straightforward. Uh, so what we see, the physical manifestations on men, by the time they reach adulthood with this, they'll have a long face with a prominent jaw, large protruding eyes, and very large testes. Children and female, there isn't really um, enough commonality to say that what they typically look like. There's too much variation. What there is is typical behavioral manifestations. Uh, I think that's misspelled. Um, and usually there's cognitive impairment, and usually there's speech delay. Uh, they have some bizarre uh, behaviors with violent temper outbursts. So these are the kids who they tantrum um, when you just try and transition them. We're done painting and we're going to go outside now. Even if they love outside, they don't transition well, and they'll have violent uh, temper outbursts. They have attention deficit, usually, um, hyperactivity, and then the autistic-like characteristics. And we'll talk about autism in just a few minutes. And I think that's a good spot to end.